uh, it's great to be here and to be live again this morning. Uh, I can't wait till we meet together again in our Sunday School classroom. We will try at that time to go live as well, but we will meet back in the classroom soon. Uh, I will keep everybody abreast of when that will take place. Uh, hopefully the first weekend in September. Uh, we will see as time moves forward. Uh, it's great to be here today. It's a great day to study God's Word. I cannot wait to get into today's lesson and tie it to last week and build a bridge for the next week. Um, uh, send out a watch party, an email, um, send a text, uh, share it on your Facebook page, and uh, let's get as many people on here as we can to watch. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit today uh, about uh, making disciples and about the Bible and our culture. And I, th I think we're going to learn quite a few things today, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I pray you got your Bible and your pen. Uh, again, if anybody ever wants any of the notes that we have, just send me a, a private message or call me or text me or whatever. And I will and give me an email and I will shoot the notes to you. I keep them here on my computer um, and be glad to send those to you. I uh, hope you're blessed today. Um, we're, we're here in uh, South Mississippi. We're anticipating the possible landing of a uh, tropical storm maybe tomorrow, Monday. Um, and so the weather's not looking great, but it's still a beautiful day in the Lord and we're going to have a great time this morning. Go ahead and open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5. And as you're opening, before we get ready to pray, I just want to let you know that I do have books at the church office uh, for what we're doing. And so if you need a book, let me know. I'll pick one up for you and give it to you at service. Uh, if you're not able to make it to service in person, if you will let me know, we'll see about maybe getting one to you. Uh, a different way, bringing it to you or something of that statue or that nature. Anyway, let's just open up with a word of prayer and let's begin to just dive in. Father, what a great day. What a privilege to be your son. What a privilege to be your daughter. Father, we thank you for your presence and we thank you for your anointing. We just pray today, Father, that you would move in our midst and I pray you would open our hearts and that you would open our minds and that we would hear what does the Word of God teach us? Lord, we are living in a day and age where there's a great divide between the world and the church. And Father, we have the answers of eternity. And I pray, God, you would help us to learn how to build bridges, God, in order to reach people that are in this world, to make the gospel appealing to those who are perishing, not to change the gospel, not to water the gospel down, but Father, just to present the gospel in its simplicity, that the world may see how desperate we need you. And I pray, God, today for every person watching, I pray for their health. I pray for their mental stability, God. I pray, God, for the churches that are meeting and, and those that are not, and I just pray that you would continue to use people all around the world to present the gospel. Lord, if we ever needed Jesus, it's now. If we ever needed a move of the Holy Spirit in a great awakening, it is now in the body. So, God, let us get beyond our comfort Beyond our mental capacity, let us stretch our faith, for your ways are not our ways, and your thoughts are not our thoughts. Father, for your ways and your thoughts are far beyond we could ever imagine. And Father, I pray that we would allow ourselves to be stretched beyond reason, to be used for your kingdom and your glory. God, we need your supernatural anointing in this day and in this hour. God, we need a passion for lost people that we've never had. Father, we need a passion for those that we disagree with. That, God, we would have a, a, a heavenly love, an agape love toward those that are in opposition to us. 
and that God, we would love them with the everlasting love of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us, Father. Forgive us, Father. Challenge us and make us like Christ. We give you glory and we give you honor. We give you praise and we thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, again, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 13 to, to 20 here in just a moment. Um, I, I encourage you, if you wasn't here or able to watch last week, I encourage you to go back on my Facebook page and watch last week. Uh, because last week we kind of laid a groundwork if you would, a foundation for the word and culture. And we, we define some of the words that we find in our culture today and, and um, we define words like modernity and post-modernity and um, religious pluralism and secular pluralism and those things. And, so, and I can hear some people maybe saying, why do we need to know these definitions? Well, we don't necessarily need to know the definitions, but we need to know where people are coming from so we know how to present the gospel in such a way that it will make sense to them. Um, and I'm going to get into this a little bit over the next two or three weeks, but Paul went to Mars Hill and he went to many other places and Paul met the people where they were. So often we expect people to come to our side of the bridge to receive the gospel. The thing is, they're not going to change their mindset. They're not going to change their worldview to hear the gospel. We have to go where they are and present the gospel in their worldview and allow the Holy Spirit to change their thinking, to change their heart, to change their mind. And so when we understand that somebody's walking around and, and they don't believe in absolute truth, Okay, and they're struggling with believing the Bible as inerrant and infallible, we must show them or begin to love them and let them understand that the Bible has proven itself. And we need to have examples of how the Bible has proven itself throughout the centuries, because it has. Um, and there's plenty of studies we can do to prove that the Bible is real and that it is accurate. The very fact that Jesus fulfilled over 400 of Old Testament prophecies is sufficient enough. And that's not only biblical history, that is history in and of itself. Um, and so when we look at the Old Testament and then we look at the life of Christ... If Christ only filled eight, only eight of the prophecies of the Old Testament, it would be less likely for him to do that than it would be to win the publisher's clearinghouse or the lottery. Uh, one in ten to the 17th power. One in ten to the 17th power. That's a lot of zeros. And yet he fulfilled not only eight, he fulfilled over 400 and that is history. That's not just from the Bible. That is historical. And we have historical evidence for that. And therefore, we can go to the Bible and show that it is real. Not only from the biblical perspective of the life of Christ, but you can read historians like Josephus, and you can read uh, early theologians like Augustine and some others, and, and some of the things that we find in the Bible have come to pass, and we can prove the Bible. So we need to have a ready answer in those things for this culture that's out there. That's just one example that they don't believe the Bible is infallible. And so this week, we're going to talk about being witnesses in this culture, um, and being salt and light, being effective witnesses. So if you will, we're going to read Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse number 13, and we're going to read down to verse 16 for now. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherein shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, 
but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Underline that phrase. It gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We want to talk about that phrase about seeing your good works and things of that nature in just a few moments. Now, Jesus is teaching here, and he's teaching in what's called the Sermon on the Mount, and he's teaching the common people, and he's using common examples in this Sermon on the Mount. And uh, one day I'm going to do an extreme study on this sermon and, and, and really dive in and do a depth study on it. I can't wait. Uh, I haven't done it yet. But anyway, we're going to talk about salt and light. Salt was used in Jesus' day in at least three ways and maybe even more. And today, if we look at it, because when we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount and we're looking at the Bible, we have to look at it in its context and its culture. Jesus was speaking to common people about everyday things. And he was saying that he, we believers are to be salt and light. And so in Jesus' day, salt had at least three primary uh, purposes. Number one, it was used as a seasoning to bring flavor to flavorless dishes. Now, in our modern society, in our modern culture, this is the primary use of salt in the Western world, is to be used as a seasoning to put in your food when you're cooking or after you cook it. But not only is salt a, a seasoner, but it also is a preservative to preserve food so it would not go bad. It is also used today in our world as a preservative. We see hams and things of that nature that are salted, and that's to preserve them and to keep them fresh for a long time so that they don't sour, so that they don't spoil, so that they don't go bad. And then also in Jesus' day, salt was also used as a fertilizer. It would prepare the soil for the seed. It would prepare the soil for the seed. What you say and how you live in front of people does affect the way in which they receive the gospel. Our lives and our words must line up with grace and forgiveness to the lost people. We must declare and demonstrate the gospel to everyone, every day, everywhere. Let me say that again. We must declare and demonstrate the gospel to everyone, every day, everywhere. Because we live in a day and age where people are not coming into the house of God. Where people, and, 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 and I understand the, the Southern Bible Belt mentality, people just need to get in church. They just need to get their life right. They just need to get in order. What we don't understand is they don't know how. They don't know why. And they're not just going to show up. And so we must, without being preachy, if you will, declare and demonstrate the gospel. So what is the gospel? The gospel is simply the good news about the finished work of Christ, his birth, his sinless life, his brutal beating, his, his crucifixion, his victorious resurrection, and his final ascension. All we need for our Christian life is all wrapped up in Christ. It doesn't need anything else. We don't need Jesus and. When we say you need Jesus and, we have just decreased the value of the life of Christ. 
of the resurrection of Christ, of the crucifixion of Christ. And we need to understand that. So let's talk about salt just a little bit more. Salt is a, sa is a seasoning that brings a flavor to a flavorless dish. Now, if we look around the world today, the world is in chaos. It, it is tasteless. It is dark. And, and we are to be salt to bring seasoning to this world. But it also is a preservative so that the food does not go bad. You and I are our brother's keeper. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to go around uh, beating people over the head and tell them to get their life in line. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is we're supposed to gently remind people. Galatians 6, 1 says, if you find a brother that has fallen, restore him gently unless you too fall away. And I'm paraphrasing there. Uh, you can mark it down and read it later. Galatians 6, 1. But what he's saying and what I'm saying is we are our brother's keeper. If we declare and demonstrate the gospel in our lives to everyone, every day, everywhere, when believers are around us, what we say and what we do will help them in their faith walk with Christ. We all struggle and we all have difficulties in our life. And in this season that we're in uh, around the world with a global pandemic and all that's going on around the world, how much more do we need preservation than ever before as believers? We have people that are believers that are all over the board when it comes to what to do and what to believe and who to listen to and who not to listen to. And, and we as believers that are grounded in the word of God need not cast judgment on anybody. We need to cast grace. We need to be salt and a preservative. We need to love and respect where people are in their decisions about what to do with their life and point out the fact that God sees them right where they are. God loves them where they are, and God is not out to get them because they decide to wear a mask or besides they decide not to go to the house of God or they do decide to wear a mask or they do decide to go to the house of God. Listen, each one of us must walk out our faith and those of us that are secure, those of us that know who we are in Christ are to be the backbone. We're to be the salt to help preserve those that are of weaker faith. Not to condemn them because they're different than us. Somebody ought to shout. And so we are to be like that fertilizer and to love people and to help preserve people in their faith or the preservative. The fertilizer in the Middle East the salt would be mixed with gypsum and it would be poured out and sometimes when the rain would come it would wash away the salt and that's where we get uh, this phrase where it loses its saltiness or its savor it's this happens when we the church do several things one it is when we would mingle with the world trying to be the world to reach the world now Understand, this has nothing to do with style, lights, or music, but it has to do with integrity and character. In other words, we allow uh, things we know that would be contrary to Scripture to begin to happen, or we begin to do things contrary to Scripture to reach the lost. Um, and we know that that loses its saltiness and its witness and its testimony. The other thing, though, that it does, when the church, the believers, add to the simplicity of the gospel, when we begin to put demands on the gospel, it begins to lose its flavor. It becomes more of a religion. I got to do this or I can't do that. And, and the gospel is simply this, that Jesus 
died and rose again for the sins of the world. God will take care of the rest. People will ask questions and you can answer those questions. But when we're talking about culture and being disciples and we're making disciples, we simply present Jesus Christ and him crucified. Everything we need to be a believer is wrapped up in the fulfillment of all Christ did at the cross. I, I know I emphasize that a lot because I want us to understand that when I'm sharing the gospel, it's not that I'm sharing all of the Bible. It's simply the fact that I'm sharing how people can come to know Christ and he can begin to develop them through his word. So that is what salt is. Salt preserves and salt brings taste and flavor. And then he talks about in this passage, light. Light dispels darkness. Let that sink in for just a minute. Light dispels darkness. We all know that. You go into a room and it's black dark and you flip a switch and the power's on and the light comes on, there's no more darkness. Let that sink in. I've said this before and I want us to get this mentality that we understand. When you and I walk into a room, wherever that room may be, we may be the only believer there. But when we walk in, the light shines. Not because of us, but because of Christ in us, who is the light of the world. And so when we walk into a room, everybody in that room may be lost. But all of a sudden, light comes in and it begins to dispel the darkness. It's a spiritual position that we have in Christ. It's a place of authority in our lives that God has given to us. And so when we go somewhere, we dispel darkness. Jesus tells us to be visible. He wants us to be seen in a dark world. He says, you do not light a candle and hide it. You set it up so the light, so it can light the darkness. Let that sink in. You do not light a candle and hide it. You set it up so it can light the darkness. May I make a couple of statements here? Churches are not in darkness usually. So if we could become a believer and all we do is hang out in the church with our faith, we're not being a light in the darkness. The world is what's dark. The world is what needs the gospel. And we're to be a light wherever we go. If Jesus is the light of the world and Jesus lives inside of us believers, then we should be light in a dark world as well. In other words, people should take note that we're different, not because of necessarily our do's and don'ts, but because of the radiant life of Jesus, the victorious life of Jesus that resides on the inside of us. I don't fight for victory. I fight from victory. I'm already victorious through the victorious one. And when we have that mentality, when we go out into a dark world, people take note and see that. And when they see that, then they become attracted. They might get convicted, whatever. But most people, most people want to live a life of joy, a life of fulfillment, and a life of victory. We have that in Christ. And that's what we're to present to them. Our faith is to be on display. Our faith is to be on display. We are in a season in our world where lost people need to see us Christians living by faith and not by sight. They need to see our light shining bright. Now, that doesn't mean that I need to, to, to negate 
the issues that are going around and and, and spiritualize them, that's not that's not reality. We need to understand the truth of the matter of what's happening on around us, but at the same time, we need to understand who we belong to, who lives inside of us, and what he's done for us, and our position in him. And when we do that, we can face any opposition and say, you know, we're living in trying times. It's difficult. We don't know which decisions to make, but I know who I belong to, and he will help me make decisions that will honor him, keep me healthy, and build up the kingdom. And that's what we need to focus on. Today, there are many false religions around the world, and they have no light. Let that sink in. There are many false religions around the world, and they have no light. They have a lot of principles. They may have a lot of regulations, but they have no light because only Jesus is the light of the world. So if we do not allow our lights to shine in a dark world, then we're no different than them. In a sense, because people are only seeing, quote, the religious aspect of a walk with Christ. And they don't need to see a religious aspect of a walk with Christ. They need to see Christ and him crucified and him resurrected and him sitting on the right hand of the Father in victory. And we are in him and he is in us. They need to see that light in our lives. Our light should shine naturally out of our hearts when we are truly in Christ. And when this happens, it draws people to the light. Jesus, not us. See, my light is not to draw attention to me. My light is to point people to Jesus. Because he is the light inside of me. Now, what do you think Jesus called us to be salt and light? One of the reasons Jesus used the metaphors of salt and light because they were so prevalent in his day and for what he was teaching about the kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount. Every listener there on that sermon uh, listening to Christ would understand to be salt would be a preservative. To be a seasoning and to, and to be a fertilizer and also to be light would be so you could see. And so it was very prominent for his day. Now, what, what would be the result if we lose our saltiness or our light? And let me add a, a second question to that statement. Have we lost our saltiness and our light in our culture? Are people attracted to who you are in Christ? Jesus calls us to be salt and light in a tasteless and dark world. We should stand out by the Christ that it lives inside of us. Next, we're going to talk about a righteous witness, verses 17 through 20. A righteous Witness, Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Listen to what Matthew says. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. No, I have come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot nor one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till it all be fulfilled. Whoever therefore shall... 
break one of these least of these commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven for i say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees you shall in no case enter into the kingdom this is a powerful passage that we need to understand and i think sometimes it gets mistranslated but that's okay um jesus was accused on many occasions of not obeying or following the law we know that uh he healed people on the sabbath and he did all kinds of things and broke the law yet in this passage in the sermon on the mount jesus said that he had come to fulfill the law or as it's put in in, in the book this week to accomplish the law's purpose to accomplish the law's purpose the purpose of the law was to point out our sinfulness and our desperate need for god and so the law is not there for us um other than to show us that we need christ this phrase can have several meanings most believe stay with me here for just a minute because it might get a little confusing but i want you to pay close attention and i'll i'll lay it out for you as simply as i can most believe that jesus fulfilled the law so then when we accept christ he gives us the power to fulfill the law and may i say this is not the case because we can't fulfill the law even paul said the things that i don't want to do i find myself doing and the things that i want to do i can't find myself to do it it is no longer i it is sin that is in me but thanks be to god i have victory through jesus christ and so so we need to understand that is not the case christ doesn't give me the power to fulfill the law no christ that would mean that the law was not fulfilled in christ christ literally fulfilled the law for me this is not um some believe that jesus fulfilled the law of sacrifice and he had become our sacrifice and we no longer have to sacrifice for ourselves and in this sense which he did sacrifice himself for us um uh, in this sense, he has become our high priest and our sacrificial lamb for the remission or the forgiveness of sins. Some believe, others believe, that Jesus came and fulfilled the law and that when He, we are in him, the law is fulfilled. In that we recognize we cannot keep the law, but he did and therefore I am complete in Christ. And this is where I think as believers we are is that christ fulfilled the law and when i'm in christ the law is fulfilled in me because of christ uh, james says that if we break one one of the laws we break them all and we all break the law it's it's not that's that difficult why would i try to continue to keep something that is impossible to keep when I surrender to Christ, he will help me in every way. Thanks be to God that I have the victory through Jesus Christ. Even when I don't keep the law, even when I don't do what I know I need to do, I still have victory through Christ. When Jesus was talking about the law in this passage, he was referring to what it was intended to mean, not merely a matter of outward appearance and religious activities, which is what the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, brought it down to. True righteousness is a matter of the heart and only comes when we are in a relationship with Christ by grace through faith. Let me say that again true righteousness is a matter of the heart and only comes when we are in a relationship with christ by grace through faith ephesians 2 8 9 highlight it memorize it read it our righteousness this is what the bible says our righteousness 
must supersede the righteousness of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Both the Pharisees and the Sadducees thought that they were righteous by observing the law and that the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and the 600 and something other laws uh, of the Old Testament. Yet all through the Gospels and Paul's letters, these Pharisees and Sadducees broke the very law they claimed to observe. If you do a study of what they did to catch Jesus in traps, almost every time they tried to catch Christ or Paul in a trap uh, for preaching a false gospel or for, or for being blasphemous, they were breaking the law. And yet that's what they observed, uh, claimed that they observed was the law of Moses and that they kept it without, without flaw. And yet they broke it all the time. Their righteousness, the Pharisees and Sadducees, was kept by the works that they did and by the religious ceremonies that they practiced. Let this sink in real hard and real deep. Their righteousness was kept by the works that they did and the religious ceremonies that they kept. The righteousness of God and Jesus' righteousness was that of spiritual principles which we obtain when we give him our lives based on whose we are, not what we do. And so when we're talking about culture and when we're talking about reaching our culture and our world with the gospel, we need to understand that it's not about the outward appearance. It's a matter of the heart. And it's only a matter of the heart because Christ lives in me. He's the hope of glory. He is the one that makes me righteous. Paul says in Colossians that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. All throughout the Old Testament, we learn that our righteousness is as filthy rags and that, that our righteousness cannot measure up to God's holiness. It can't do it. And even the Sadducees and Pharisees, even in their abiding of the law, could not measure up to the standard of God's holiness and righteousness. Why? Because God ordained that Jesus would come and fulfill those laws, complete those laws, and that when we are in him, then we become righteous before God. When we are in Christ, we become holiness before God. Holiness is not a standard of living. Holiness is a position in Christ, a matter of the heart. My lifestyle will be an outflow of what Christ has done on the inside. I don't live the life to become something. I live the life because I am something in Christ. And when we're talking about this passage and living righteously, we need to understand that. Because when we go out to reach the world and we tell them, you got to obey the law, you, you got to change this, you better do this, you better not do that, we're not preaching the gospel. We're preaching religion. We need to go back to preaching the simple gospel. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that is what Paul preached. He said very plainly, I come preaching nothing but Christ and him crucified. And we, the church, need to get back that if we're going to reach our culture with the gospel, because that is what the gospel is. We set our minds on his kingdom, not ours. When we truly understand that our righteousness comes only through Christ, we can truly rest in him and walk in his authority and show forth his glory. And it talks about the works that we do will glorify the Father. I don't do the works out of um, 
to gain something. I do the works as an outflow of who I am and whose I am, of the completed, finished work of Christ. It's a natural outflow of what's on the inside. It's a natural outflow. I don't do it to gain something to be more like Christ. I don't do it to be more godly. I don't do it to be more holy. I don't do it to be more righteous because I can't be. I do it simply because I've been made righteous in Christ. I do it because I've been made holy in Christ. And when I realize that, what I do is an outflow of what's already completed inside of me. And it comes naturally to the believer. Now, does my flesh wrestle with that? All the time. But the reality is, it's still when I'm in the mindset of Christ, and I'm trying to be more like Christ, a natural outflow would be a Christ-like life. And so we need to understand that, that those works are not something I do to be more like Christ, but they're because I'm already in Christ. I got a few minutes here. I want to go back to Exodus chapter 31 and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about scripture and the arts. I mentioned this last week and and um, I'm going to try to get this done in, in the amount of time we have left. This is a challenging and yet uh, very touchy subject. And it's one that needs to be addressed. And I'm going to try to do justice to it. I, I pray you would think about the things we're going to talk about. Because a lot of what we're going to talk about may be very contrary to some of the things we believed all of our life. All right. Spirit anointed skills. Exodus 31, starting in verse number 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and silver and in brass, and the cutting of stones, to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And so when we talk about spirit anointed skills, I want to say this very cautiously and very carefully, and I, I want you to pay close attention. Let me start out by saying that the church, by and large, has lost the culture war, especially when it comes to the arts. The great scholar and theologian Francis Schaeffer did a series back in the 70s, early 70s, called How Should We Then Live? Listen, it is great. You need to watch it. It's on Amazon Prime or you can watch it on YouTube. How should we then live? Yes, it may be a little boring. And yes, it may it may uh, take a little getting used to his uh, the way he presents it. It's kind of like a documentary. But it is so profound for the gospel and for the day in which we live. He goes through how... The culture has changed through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and the Enlightenment, and how the church has, for the most part, remained the same or changed very little, and, and it's very good, and it's challenging. I encourage you to watch it. You can also buy the book, uh, probably on Amazon, or Christian Book Distributors. The church during the Middle Ages and during the Dark Ages and even in the Renaissance really separated itself from the world, and it has yet to fully make a huge impact on culture since that time. Far too often, we the church sit back and condemn the world and the culture for being and doing what the world and culture does. We keep forgetting so often that man is lost and bent toward evil. There is none righteous, no, not one. And we, we expect the world 
to be different. We expect the culture to get better and to do better. How? How can we expect that? We got to change our expectation. We are to demonstrate the gospel to everyone, everywhere, every day. If you want the culture to change, you be the change agent in the culture in which you reside. You see, we live in a fallen world, and this fallen world is not going to change because we'd like it to. It's only going to change when you invest spiritually in the lives of those that are around you and they come to a knowledge of Christ and they give him their life and the Holy Spirit begins to live in them and they begin to live out the Christ life. Um, and that's what's going to change the world and the culture. Uh, we need to begin to impact this world and culture with the gospel. In this passage in Exodus, we notice that Belial was anointed by God's spirit to work with gold, wood, silver, and bronze. This was so he could help lead others in the building of the tabernacle. God has people in all walks of life. Now, this is another flip side of the coin to this passage about the arts. This has to do with where you are in your life. <clears throat> so, he was anointed by God so he could help lead in the building of the tabernacle. God has people in all walks of life to live out the gospel in their field. If we truly belong to God and we truly are where we are supposed to be, then we will make a huge impact at our jobs for his kingdom. We must not adapt to their way. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We must stand steadfast in grace for the kingdom. God's spirit gives us the power to do this. Most people are not called into vocational ministry. What is vocational ministry? It's where people make their living in ministry, whether it's traveling evangelists, pastors, youth pastors, some of them, music people, those types. But most people are not called into vocational ministry, but every believer is called into ministry. Now, when we hear the word arts, in our day, we think of TV, movies, theater, and things of this like. And for um, for many, many years, the church was was totally against the arts, just the way it was. And most of us today are either for certain arts or against other arts. And we stand on either side pointing fingers at the believers on the other side while the world looks back and forth at us like a tennis match. And we wonder why they don't want to become like us. I can be against something and not have to use that as something to have a disagreement or an argument about. There are certain things that I shouldn't watch or listen to, but if all we do as believers is separate from anything that the world has to do with, then how can we reach them and know what they need? Let me, let me make that simple. Give me just a minute. I'm going to come back to that. Do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we can do whatever we want. I am simply saying that we need to quit fighting amongst ourselves and to get our head out of the sand and reach the lost. I'm not saying we need to become the world. What I'm saying is we need to understand where the world is. When Daniel went to Babylon, the Bible declares that Daniel was learned in all of their practices. Let that sink in. There were soothsayers. There was magicians. There was astrologers. And they taught the 70 men that sat in the king's court, and Daniel was one of them. He didn't practice, participate in those events, but he learned them. 
he, he still stayed faithful to God. See, we can learn about the world without becoming the world. And we need to. The Bible declares that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Which means we need to have an idea of what's going on in the world without practicing what's going on in the world. Paul said, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. All things are permissible, but what I'm, I will not be slave to anything. And that's in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12. Read the whole passage. Read it in context. In other words, what Paul is saying in that passage, if I want to watch certain movies, um, I can, but it might not be good for me. Now, understand me. I'm not talking about watching movies that are contrary to to my faith. I'm not talking about um, movies that are that are outright in sin and those things. I'm talking about uh, things like um, Harry Potter. I'm talking about things like um, Twilight and those movies. I don't watch them. I'm not going to watch them. But I'm not going to sit back and, and argue or tell other people that they can't. Uh, they have to answer to God for their decisions, and and it may not be beneficial for them, but they have the they have the privilege to do that. And somebody has to watch that movie to to be able to tell us other believers where it's coming from. Somebody has to investigate it. If we're going to learn about the culture and understand what they're putting out there, then somebody has to watch it to understand it and compare it and bring it through the filter of Scripture so that we can learn from it. I choose not to watch these things, and I encourage others not to do so, and if I have a reason, I share why, but I will not condemn them for doing so. If it is within my place, in other words, if they're in my sphere of learning and growing, I might educate them on show or movie or art or whatever. But I'm not going to condemn them. I'm just going to let them know the facts and let them make their decision. This lesson almost seems like I should allow Christians to participate in the world. I am and I'm not. I am that and I'm not. We need to be in the world, but not of the world. We must know about what is happening in our world in order to impact it. We got to know where people are getting their information, what's developing the culture. Remember the definition of culture last week? The arts, the thinking, um, and those types of things develop a culture. And if we don't know what they're watching, and if we don't know what's going through their heads, then we don't know what their culture is, and we don't know necessarily how to reach them. And yes, I know, simply preach Christ and Him crucified. But you got to know how to build the bridge. Paul knew about it the culture of every city that he visited. When you do an investigation of Paul in the book of Acts, in the book of Romans, in the first in the book of Corinthians, in all of these books, Paul knows what is going on in these cities. And he didn't even have the internet. He didn't even have a phone. He didn't even have a car. He did all this through word of mouth, through letters. Yet he knew about the cultures of every place that he went. And he addressed the people where they were. Not where he wanted them to be, but where they were. And if you read the accounts of Paul's testimony in Acts, and I believe it's five different times he gave his testimony in the book of Acts, and all five times... He said the same thing. I was on my way to Damascus. Jesus showed up. I fell to the ground. I was blind and went into the city. A man prayed for me. The scales fell off. I got saved. I got baptized. And I got filled with the Holy Ghost. 
and now I'm preaching the gospel. Five different times Paul gave that same testimony. Was his life changed? Absolutely. Radically changed. But you never see Paul really telling about the change in his life other than in Philippians when he said, I was all of these things, but all of that meant nothing for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. What do you know about the culture in your world? Do you think the people in your community have the mindset that you do? No. They do not. Most of them do not. In order to know how to reach them, you must know what is keeping them away to some degree. Now, I wrote down in our culture here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, we are a very artistic town here in Ocean Springs. We have the Walter Anderson Museum, um, and, and that brings in a lot of people from around the culture. We need to learn a little bit about Walter Anderson, where he come from, and what group of people are following him, know how to reach them. Then we got Cruise in the Coast, which is popular. Tens of thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people come to Cruise in the Coast. And where are they coming from? What background and what can we do to reach them? Then we also have here in Ocean Springs, Sherwood Pottery, which is a worldwide uh, business. How do we reach the people that are involved there? Um, our local church at Northside Assembly of God, we do what's called a Mardi Gras outreach, which is phenomenal because Mardi Gras is a big event here on the coast. And so our church for Mardi Gras gets out of our church and reaches the people that go into the Mardi Gras parade. We ha we open up our campus to allow them to use our restroom. We serve hot dogs and we have prayer with them. And we make that connection with many families that would otherwise not come to our property. And then we also have a J July 4th outreach. And it, and it sounds simplistic. We simply have a huge shrimp boil. Why do we do that? Because shrimping is a big industry here on the coast, and most people love shrimp. And so we open the doors and do a big shrimp bowl to allow people to come onto our site, families that don't go to church and enjoy something that's part of this culture, which is the fishing and shrimping industry. And it reaches and touches lives and opens the door for families to share the gospel with other family members and bring them into our facility to enjoy a meal, to hear the gospel, and to be a part of the kingdom ministry of Northside. As we continue next week in this study of the word of God and culture, I challenge you to learn about the culture in which you live and then find ways that God will allow you to reach out and reach them with the gospel jesus christ crucified resurrected and ascended to the right hand of the father that is the gospel father we thank you for today thank you for the word of god have your way in our lives and help us be a light in a dark world and help us be salt to a tasteless world and god help us to understand the culture in which we live so that we might present the gospel in such a way that it would be received by those around us that are lost. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. See y'all next week.